giving me an opportunity to be here and here for the first time in this institute and it is so uh, impressive and that they are doing such a great job because of uh, Baba's blessings and uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Yesterday we had a, uh, some some of the topics were covered in the hemodynamic pressure traces. Today we'll have two more uh, cases in the interactive session, followed by some interactive session on some oximetry. Following Dr. Ramakrishnan's talk, this will be very very simple. He had such a beautiful presentation on a complex uh, topic, but this is really fundamental. But this is also important for the students. So we'll just go through the some of the rest of the hemodynamic traces. Uh, can anybody say what is yesterday we went through all the waveforms in the chambers and the maneuvers, uh, pullbacks and all that. So here the scale is given. Can anybody interpret this? ECG is there. There for uh, correlation. It's returned there, retrograde aortic cap. What is the diagnosis? Pardon, any one person? Left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Yes. Okay, so uh, what is the obstruction? What are the types of, now they had a discussion on uh, outflow tract obstruction. So what is the possible diagnosis? Is there a clue to tell where the LVOT obstruction is? Can one person take it up? Yeah, please. Pardon? It is. It is a dynamic obstruction or a fixed uh, membranous stenosis? Dynamic obstruction, spike and uh, Yes, it is, it is suggestive that uh, you can see that there is a, a gradient from LV to, uh, there is no gradient at the aortic valve. The LV OT and the aortic pressure, pressures are the same. The gradient is between the LV body and the left ventricular outflow tract. So, but when the catheter is pulled back into the aorta, you can see that it's a typical spike and dome pattern in the aortic pressure trace. This is not a very beautiful, but when some more traces are coming, I will show you. Uh, the ejection is typically mid-systolic in the early part of ejection is uh, not obstructive in HOCM, unlike in a fixed uh, valvular stenosis which starts even from the beginning of uh, systole. So the initial, because the initial ejection is unobstructed, you have a spike and the early ejection is uh, very rapid. You can see in the biotic pressure trace, the upstroke is quite uh, brisk and uh, there is no unobstructed. And after the initial ejection, the obstruction comes on because of the venturi effect, the uh, uh, antidemital leaflet touches the septum and then the obstruction comes and then you have the dome. So the typical uh, spike and dome is suggested of a dynamic obstruction. Uh, so, anybody can uh, tell what is uh, shown here? Yeah, what is uh, Brock and Bro is correct. What is uh, Brock and Bro sign? Brock and Bro sign? What is. Uh, can someone take it? Yeah, any one of you? Oh, sweetie. There is an increasing gradient, but there is a falling system in the same Fall, yes. Fall pressure is decreased. Fall pressure, yes. Why? How is it different from fixed uh, aortic stenosis? Fixed obstruction also there is increasing gradient, but the pulse pressure will not. Yes. So the fall and the pulse pressure, yes, good. You can see that the this is the pulse pressure in the aorta. You can see there is a good gradient between LV and aorta in this B, and then there is an extra systole. And then you have a long uh, filling period following the ectopic B. And then you have the obstruction which is worse. And you can have the LV pressure goes up and the pulse pressure becomes less. That is, that is, the, that is the brown wall sign, the rock and brown brown wall sign. And because the obstruction is worsened, this is because of excessive contractility in the post uh, extra systolic B that the obstruction is worsened as in the uh, as against a fixed, sub, uh, fixed valvular stenosis where the obstruction is not worsened but the gradient is more. So you have the LV pressure is very high and the pulse pressure is small. That is different from 
uh, valvular stenosis. Because the obstruction is worsened, the spike and dome has become very classical and obvious. So here you can you, the same thing is explained here. You can see the pulse pressure is this is the pulse pressure in the normal beat, and following the extra systole, the pulse pressure is narrow. That is the Brock and Brown wall sign in the dynamic LPOTO. But this is the fixed uh, valvular stenosis where you have a good gradient between LV and IOTA and then you have an extra systole. And in post extra systolic beat, you can see the pulse pressure is actually little more than this, this beat. That is before the obstruction. So here also the gradient is becoming more, but the pulse pressure doesn't become less. So that is how you tell the fixed valvular stenosis. Can you tell the difference again here between the two traces? This is again LB and IOTA. So there is. I want to just tell you pressing of LB and IOTA. Yes. Good. There is a pressure gradient between LB and IOTA. Good, good way of saying it. Pardon? The area under curve is the main gradient. Yes. No, no, but there are two there traces. There are two, two traces. This is, a, this is a difference from this. There are two different patients. It's not the same. Both have uh, LVOT obstruction. There is a good gradient. What you are saying is that the mean gradient is uh, shown here. What else? What else can you appreciate? Ah, yes. 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 Very good. This is a spike and dome pattern is seen well. This is a dynamic LVOT the, this to be differentiated here, you have the slow rising, late peaking, uh, iotic waveform, and the, this is shown as mean gradient, that is okay. But the to be, thing to be appreciated is the initial upstroke in the iotic pressure waveform in a dynamic LPOTO, it is not obstructed. The obstruction comes much later, it is just after the initial ejection that the anti mitral leaflet touches the septum. So the obstruction occurs here, and then you have the dome. So the initial rejection is very rapid. That's why you have a jerky pulse in uh, dynamic LVOT obstruction, whereas this is a very slow rising pulse in fixed valvular stenosis. And it is a very late peaking. Yeah, can you comment on this trace? This is again LV and IOTA. It's all marked here, brachial artery actually. The LV and IOTA. Did you see Yesterday we were discussing what are all the factors you have to look at when you interpret a trace. Uh, when this is uh, simultaneous <coughs> tracing of LV and IOTA, in yes. the first part, that is AF is there, so actual kick is not there. That is why preload is less, so gradient is more. In the next half, sinus rhythm is there. So I will, it will be more. So the preload will increase and gradient will increase. Excellent. Excellent. Not AF protein. Not AF. Yes. Sometimes you know uh, the yes. There is no A there is no A V synchrony. Good. Very good uh, interpretation. And you have to always look at the ECG and look at the pressure trace. Very good. Then this this is also it's all marked here. Will be IOTA scale, everything is written here. It is a pullback. So can you interpret uh, supravalvar AS diagnosis is correct? When you pull back from LV to IOTA? You don't have the recording slides. In first class, you can see the catheter inside the LV. The diastolic pressure is much low. As we pull back, the diastolic pressure is increased and the diastolic pressure is the same in the third part also. So it indicating we are in the IOTA. Yes. So after that, there is a gradient. So indicating the supravalvar Excellent. Why is it not going? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, pretty. But, uh, it's not wide. Yeah, one, it's immediately following the thing. Then, what right. else? You can look at the waveform and the, anything suggested from the waveform in the proximal uh, high pressure chamber in the IOTA. Anything to suggest that it is a supravalvar AS rather than a co-op? Looking at the waveform itself, yeah, as we were doing. Yes. 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 Y
So, yeah, at least it is not my, there is a significant group, the, the whole of diastole, there is a gradient, existing up to the, in any diastole also there is a good gradient, and the scale is here, uh, 50 almost this uh, 25. So, it is significant MS. So, yes, uh, yes. yes. Just go back to three. Yeah. Like always, always, we, you're all echo people. Your, your primary understanding of echo is much better than the previous generation. Whenever you're asked about keyboard analytics, whenever you ask about a clinical interpretation, always think of your echo. So, same thing in your echo, what will be the pattern like? It is going to be a pattern like this. Yes. It's going to be a pattern like M. The same thing is going to be reversed. It's going to be a good M. So, the question is very simple to answer. It's going to be severe MS in the results. The same thing clinically also when you are asked to interpret of where, how it is going to be, always think of your echo, because you will see thousands of echoes there. Yes, that is very excellent. I always you could keep, yesterday also I showed you the correlation and eye text stenosis, uh, it was uh, overlapped with the echo. Always you do echo and then you take the patient to the lab, so you already have some idea and you can compare. So, this is how severe. This is again similar patient, patient or this patient also is a good patient and this is a little longer cycle. So how severe is this MS? Okay, in the beginning the scale also is here, 50 is almost for 25 in the beginning and then in the end actually there is minimal gradient. So, Actually, this is the same patient. I showed you the first three weeks initially, and this is the week which we showed you now. So, the, with this underscores the importance of the cycle length, that is the rate of flow which will determine the gradient. So, it's not always the gradient alone which you should keep in mind to tell about the severity of the stenosis. It also depends on the cardiac output and the rate at which the flow is occurring across the mitral band. So gradient has got meaning only when you know the when you know the back of your mind about the cardiac output and the flow, the rate of flow. Okay, that is the goal. If you remember the Gaulian equation, if all the factors are there in the equation. So you know the relationship between the valve area, the gradient, the heart rate, and the flow. Okay, so you should remember that only looking at the gradient, don't jump to conclusion. One, one second. What is the clinical correlate of this slide that you see here? Yeah. In AF and high rates, uh, the whatever gradient we get on echo may not be true. Uh, I said clinical, clinical. Clinical code. In AF, when patient is uh, severe, patient is having with AF, if patient has a long cycle there, then you may still get pre systolic accentuation on this electron. More than three centimeters. High heart will be more symptomatic. Yes, that is very good. Yeah. The gradient will be more. The rate One point is the high heart, which is why we try to slow their heart rate. Second thing is, if you auscultate, which uh, I don't know how many people do nowadays, and listen carefully, the auscultatory find, findings will change cycle as the cycle length changes. If you pay attention to that, that is exactly what is being shown in this slide. The important thing is to auscultate carefully and listen to the sound. So here again there are two patients with the mitral stenosis. What is what has made this difference? It's the same patient. This area is shaded, showing the mean gradient, LA LV mean gradient. Here what has happened to the same patient? What is possible? We do it in the lab when you do PTMC, you take up the case uh, severe mitral stenosis. Sometimes you may not be able to show so much gradient, you are in doubt. So what do you do to demonstrate and then the carry on with the procedure? The metropolis is given to increase the heart rate. Yes. That has increased the gradient. Yes, yeah, typically. So that shows the effect of the heart rate on the transmitted gradient. Okay, so that is typically that is very important. Whenever the heart rate goes up, the gradient is uh, more. So that is the importance of giving uh, beta blockers in patients with even in sinus rhythm and in atrial fibrillation to control the ventricular response and digoxin also to block the AV node and reduce the ventricular response so that the transmitted gradient is less and the pulmonary venous hypertension and the pulmonary edema are less. So, there are two traces here. Can somebody interpret and say what is depicted?
Second yeah, who? Yes. Give the mic there. It's great because the exotic conclusions say I have one of the second synopsis. I mean, in first uh, diagram, the LA pressure is 6 and uh, that, uh, uh, that is transferred to pulmonary venous. Then there is a task pulmonary gradient of around uh, uh, 14. So, uh, sorry, 6. Uh, so, uh, it is just a passive transmission of pressure. In the second, there is development of active uh, stenosis because of pulmonary vasoconstriction. So here the LA pressures are 30 and uh, there the mean pulmonary artery pressure is uh, 100. So there is an increased transpulmonary gradient of more than 15, suggestive of second stenosis because of pulmonary vasoconstriction. No, it's not vasoconstriction. Second stenosis is correct, but it's pulmonary vascular disease. It's because of the pulmonary vascular disease. This is reactive. So if you, if you have here, the pressure is not very high. Supposing, imagine this patient had a PA pressure of uh, say around uh, 30. Then, uh, then or in the ordinary case, without a pulmonary vascular disease, at least some PA pressure will be little high. But in this patient, the PA pressures are very high. Okay, the systemic pressure is much more than the systemic pressure. And there is disease in the pulmonary vascular system. So it is irreversible. So even if you open the mitral valve, sometimes the PA pressure will not fall immediately on the table. Like in reactive pulmonary hypertension, once you open the mitral valve, immediately you can record less PA pressures. Okay, in pulmonary vascular disease, it, is, it may not happen. Here it is shown clearly. This is a normal. Here there is reactive pulmonary hypertension without vascular disease. Okay, the PA here, the left atrial pressure is high. This is normal LA pressure. Here the LA pressure is high, 25. The PA pressure is around 45. So it is a reactive pulmonary hypertension. Here the PLA mean is high and the PA is very high. PA pressure, PA mean and you have disease. This is second stenosis. What is the clinical correlate of that? Yeah, you can observe it is written here. What will happen to the patient at this stage? Yes. So, like, Dysnia, like, 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 Dr. Dr. Balachandar said, that they purchased relief of dyspnea at the cost of fatigue. Yeah. Here, the low output symptoms, like fatigue, will be the common symptom. And also, you don't get it, so it's really high. Because if you look to left side, you will decrease. Because the PH, that's the garden will decrease. Yes. Cardiac output on the right. That's not the garden will decrease. So the, just now Dr. Sriram was asking what is a clinical correlate, see you have the, the, this is just to show you it's not a question, it is for you to understand the second heart, the distance between the S2 and the OS, see the second valve, the second heart sound occurs here, the aortic valve closes and then this is the LA LV pressure gradient in three uh, severities of mild stenosis, mild, moderate and severe. So if you look at the LA LV pressure crossover. So here the opening snap uh, occurs. So this S2 opening, S2 OS interval is very small. And as the severity of mitral stenosis is less, the interval is more. The similarly, the first heart sound also, the DPDT determines the loudness of the first heart sound in severe mitral stenosis. See, when the LA LV pressure crossover occurs at a much higher point here in severe mitral stenosis, already the DPDT has gone up by the time the mitral valve closes. That's why it is, that's a clinical correlation with that. So, what does this show? This is again a LV and a pulmonary capillary bridge. Procedure has been done. Acute and mild ones. Procedure is dominant V-waves. Acute and Yeah, this is one tracing you don't like to look at. Yeah. This is you are dreading this uh, condition in the every beginning of the year. So uh, very severe MR with a very large giant uh, B wave because LA is small and non compliant Not in all cases. You do take up cases which are very giant LA with chronic. Uh, we, do, we do such procedures very often. But this is a typical patient in which the LA is uh, small and then they don't uh, tolerate. You go into uh, the same patient. Uh, I showed this case yesterday also, it's uh, interesting. 
uh, the same when, when you go produce such severe MR in a non compliant delay, can just get transmitted to the PA and can produce an artifact in the necrotic limb of the uh, PA. Here again, the severe MR. That is only a Campbell Home sign. Campbell Home sign. Yes. How do you say that it's a V-wave? It's an artifact. How do you know exactly that that is a V-wave of the uh, earmark? Yes. 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 Yes.
Uh, we are staying in think of Jesus. Uh, uh, we are having more immediately think of this view. Then immediately on the other side it correlates. R is uh, that lead to IOTA and uh, L is lead to PA. Now that is not that is not enough for a new measure. So what else is needed? Is it is it facility energy or uh, how do you do? Energy. How do you do? Energy. 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 As a step of <laughs> then, then you look at the, the atrial level. If the ASD adequate, <laughs> obviously, this is the ASD has to be adequate, LA pressure is slightly higher than RS. <laughs> so, all this should be your full diagnosis. Uh, there's another child who is 34 year old with uh, increased uh, recorded activity and there is uh, cyanosis. This is the saturation. Can someone just take it up and explain why? Yes. Saturation is with the orange sample is the same. It's actually serology. 90% of the orange. LA, RA, which sample pressure of the outer is maintained. Uh, no, but beyond that, that, beyond that, like Dr. Ramakrishnan said, this is DM. Yeah. Ah. Where is the DM? Uh, is there. Uh, 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 RA level is there. So, where was the step up? SCC. SCC is quite okay. It is a cardiac type. From the step up is in the RA. There is some pulpy hypertension. I think we will use this to try to almost the common mistake that other than happens. The who are answering the question? But I made one mistake. Anybody feel that one mistake? Is it an obligate patient? What is an obligate patient that you know to get something? There are two things here. One is the English obligate patient. That means uh, this ASD is not going to take you that. That's an English obligate patient. But what does an obligate patient mean by you know that? That is what is the uh, obligate patient. So, so, so that is, that, this may not be a classical obligation. Mm -hmm. So, this is a uh, five year old baby present with severe uh, respiratory distress and in shock. X ray shows uh, no cardiomegaly, pulmonary edema. Yeah, where is the TFPC? I think that they will Yes. Correct. Here is a nine month old child who underwent a palliative procedure on day 40 of life. Recently 
like uh, the hormonal factors and the viscosity and all those things in, uh, in such patients. Clearly, if it is less than 0.25, it is normal. 0 0.2 above uh, 0.75 is clearly contraindicated. 0.25 to 0 0.5, where the net strength is just to right and the ratio is less than 0.5, is still may be operable. Between 0.5 and 0 0.75 is still a gray area and uh, you don't know whether the oxygen study is still in the head. And uh, this is a child with uh, 8 months old, uh, Down syndrome. Just give them. Yeah. It'll be easy to be also. And I think that's how it's done. 